I'm Linda Hurst. I'm Jim Carney, and this is EdCast, a program created and produced by educators for everyone interested in education. Of all the skills taught in school, learning how to read is perhaps the most crucial. Children who don't acquire proficiency in reading fall behind academically and often find themselves struggling to graduate or find successful careers. With reading so central to achievement in school and beyond, knowing the best way to teach reading is of vital importance. Is there a right way to teach reading? And if there is, what does it look like? When should children learn to read? Pre-K, kindergarten, first grade, later? Today, acclaimed educator Deborah Meyer joins me to discuss what we know about learning to read and what we can do to support children to become good readers. Now we join Linda and her guest in the studio. My guest today is Deborah Meyer. She is currently senior scholar at New York University's Steinhardt School of Education. She has spent more than four decades in public education as a teacher, principal, and writer. In 1974, she founded the well-known Central Park Elementary School, CPE1, a successful public school that served predominantly local minority families. During the next dozen years, she opened two other Central Park Elementary Schools in District 4, as well as an acclaimed secondary school. She is the author of numerous books and articles, including The Power of Their Ideas, Lessons to America from a Small School in Harlem, and In Schools We Trust. The recipient of the MacArthur Genius Award, Deborah Meyer is a recognized expert on creating effective schools. Thank you so much for joining us today Thank on ECAS. It's really my pleasure to have you Thank on the program. You. I want to just start by asking you. By the way, you, this is the power of their ideas. Oh, there it is. Okay, yeah. well, in the, we'll pull those up. That's great. It. <laughs> I cannot read the title of it being. It's in Chinese. In Chinese, <laughs> right. Um, why do you think conversations about teaching reading have been so polarizing? It's a in very interesting question. And I've often been intrigued, too, by the fact that there tends to be a political bias that people on the left uh, are more for psycholinguistics, whole language, whatever you want to call it. <clears throat> the people on the right more likely to be phonics. And uh, I can make some theories up, but I actually don't know. Okay. Uh, after all, traditionally, uh, children didn't lead, learn to most children who went to school were upper class children and they actually learned to read from nannies and, and tutors at home. <coughs> and uh, there are very few descriptions of that. When you read uh, about the lives of these people mm. who had tutors, there's a virtually no a description of their learning to read. That's interesting. Now, what is your definition of reading? To you, what does it mean to read? It's making sense of something. Like, you know, children are very good at reading the teacher's face, they make sense of what that person is up to. And uh, it's the same word. It means ma making sense, in this case, uh, out of written words. Now, you've mentioned in many of your writings that you feel that we have many misconceptions about how children learn how to read. I come from an educational background as a teacher, where the dichotomy was between phonics and whole language. Are those still two of the extremes that we look at today, or has that ground shifted a little bit? Uh, it goes back and forth all over the place. When I, when I was a child, I think it was called look and say. Um, you looked at a word, and then you said the word. And those were the Dick and Jane <coughs> books. Well, yeah, although it was a little before Dick and Jane. Okay, but they called them <laughs> look and say books. But, yeah, and, right, yeah. uh, but it was not any phonics. In fact, when I was growing up, when I started substituted teaching was the first time I discovered anything about phonics. Uh, so when you learned how to read, do you remember how you, how you were taught? Well, I, I remember curious, that how they taught, because that was common in that period in what I call the look and say. Mm -hmm. you, were very, and, you repeated very simple words. Uh, it was essentially Dick and Jane. And there was no phonics attached to it at none, all? None, none. I was, um, uh, this is uh, the generation who became adults in World War II or after. <laughs> Um, but you remember <coughs> that. You know, I just wanted to say that when I teach graduate students, I often ask them if they remember when they were taught how to read, and yeah. almost everybody does. So it is a very pivotal moment in your life when you realize that you can make sense of yeah, those Yeah, but that's swiddles. the difference between remembering how I was taught and remembering how I learned. Two very different things, And I things. don't remember okay. how I learned, just as, mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's a fairly recent phenomenon that we know how children learn to speak. 
it was thought originally that they just imitate. Right. And then we've discovered by following it, <coughs> excuse me, following it very closely, that they are inventing rules as they go along and um, saying things that they've never heard said. Right, and Pinker would say that's because of the, the language instinct that we are programmed to learn language. Yeah. So mm -hmm. let's talk about that vis-a-vis -vis reading then. You have said, I think in some of your readings, that reading, learning how to read should be a natural process. you want to talk about that a little bit? Well, uh, I think almost everything we learn would be best learned as a natural process. And that is that we do what, try to make sense of it. We try to read what's going on. <coughs> and um, if we're in an environment where people are speaking a language, uh, then when we're very little children, first we just start making lots of sounds. Mm -hmm. And then we narrow that down, those sounds down to the ones that are in the native language. We just make American sounds. And then after that, we start making American intonations. So babies babble in an American language way mm -hmm. rather than in a French way. And even gestures mm -hmm. <laughs> that go with speech. And uh, they get closer and closer. They try out some words. Uh, they get a response. and. Uh, in any case, all of that was only discovered by observing very carefully. And uh, some friends of mine did the same thing uh, with watching children learn to read, who were being taught by very many different methods. So what did and they what, discover? Well, they discovered they were all learning the same way. <laughs> Meaning what? How were they learning? Uh, they were learning by a combination of um, um, recognizing words and recognizing patterns, just as we do in speech. And because uh, they know something about the language it's itself, so they know that certain words are more likely to follow other words. So they bring all the other knowledge that they have about language into the reading. So it, ton it requires creating an environment for children in reading more like we do in uh, oral language. So um, then it needs to be rich, and there needs, it needs to be You're rich. really talking about, I think, children developing kind of a template. They know. They, if they're read to, they know narrative structure and they know what happens. Yeah. And that's not, that's uh, in Chomsky's terms, he's a linguist who right. said we are um, programmed mm -hmm. to learn language. Right. Uh, but he, the same um, idea lies behind being programmed to walk, being programmed to see distances, mm -hmm. you know, uh, all of these, everything that we can do is natural to us. But we need a certain setting, and the setting we need for children is one to create a setting where they're not likely to fail too often. Uh, <coughs> you know, my son, uh, one of my sons, had a very hard time learning to ride a bike, and after several falls, you know, and children differ. Some can tolerate a lot of failure, some less. He didn't want to ride a bike anymore, and we had to figure out a sneaky ways to teach him. To what you do? To, well, first of all, he didn't want to fall in front of other people. He was embarrassed about it. So we got training wheels and went somewhere where no one knew could him. see him. <laughs> Crossing and the when state he, line. Uh, when he was good enough, then we pre he pretended he had learned to read. So all kinds of things. I, I think I can't read music. I took tons of piano lessons, and I can work my way through a score of music. But my mother could pick up any music and sit down there and play it. And I decided that I was a failure, and I quit taking lessons because my m I couldn't see how I went from here to there. And that's because I was reading note by note. And uh, my mother was reading phrase by phrase, and she knew something about musical language. So she knew what kind of notes, would chords would go with which notes. And I was just simply doing what a lot of children do. I was reading note by note. So let's go back to that then, because to me that has a connection to reading words, letter by letter, or meaning by meaning. So yeah. let's talk about how you think. Well, you know, it would be impossible if we really were doing that. It would, it literally, uh, children would have to be geniuses if they were really learning to read letter by letter. Right, OK. The, and the simpler the language is, the more child-oriented the language is, the more difficult it would be, because it's part of the peculiarity about English, that is, the simple words actually come from German, and the more complicated words 
tend to come from Latin. So uh, the more common, the Latin words are easier to read. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I could, uh, did you have? <laughs> We're going to put these words up. You want to talk, let's talk about what are we going to be looking at? We're going to have We're going to look and see what would happen if we really believed that you learned uh, to read by pronouncing letters. By pronouncing letters. Okay, so let's take a look at what, what are some of the examples that you have. Well, um, our uh, viewers will see those too, but right now we'll look okay, at these. Okay, well, uh, simple one, cone and done. Uh, the only difference is the first letter. Of course, <laughs> we also have a peculiarity that C is usually not pronounced like C, so you have to explain that to kids and then you have to explain why sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. And, and even with the rule we teach them if it ends in an E there's a long vowel yeah. sound and done that would not be the case. Not it's not don't. Case. Okay. One versus one. I won a game versus one. Now the simple word one is there's no phonics that could right. explain that word. <laughs> uh, <laughs> the number one, you're right, yes. Uh, two versus T-W-O mm -hmm. versus T-O-O. Mm -hmm. We pronounce them the same. Um, of course, T-W-O, uh, there's no wa sound in two. Two, wa o mm -hmm. would never get me to two. Uh, th there's interesting connection with it. You know, 20 and two, and there's those T-W has mm -hmm. a meaning, but mm -hmm. it's not a pronunciation meaning. Eight, number eight, mm -hmm. versus eight. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, those are very basic words. Uh, they, have, uh, they both have an E in it, one at the end and one at the beginning, mm -hmm. and otherwise they haven't got a, oh, there's a T in both mm -hmm. of them. Uh, otherwise, there's really nothing about mm -hmm. those two words. Run versus done. Uh, we're back to that mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> cone, done, but there's also run, which is a UN. And uh, come versus rum versus home. One is O-M-E, one is U-M. Those two are pronounced the same. But home, which looks exactly the same, has a long, has a long O. Right. Work versus jerk, one has an O. <laughs> One has an E. Bun versus ton versus tuna. Um, you know, T-U-N is ton, mm -hmm. and then we should add an a uh sound. And even the a uh sound is interesting because do we add an a uh sound, an a sound? Um, and sometimes the a hasn't got an a sound at all if it's certain. So we have a whole, there are about 200 rules, so how every one of which has ex uh, is an exception to another rule. So how do we learn that? Obviously, you and I and many people, we, we can say cone versus done. How did we learn Not that? The same way we didn't, we learned speech. We, we can take in uh, sound. We can take in the whole letter of work in, mm -hmm. one, mm -hmm. in one look. And because words have to be in a context, right. the advantage of not going sound by sound also is that you can take in four sounds for the same amount of time you can take in four words, mm -hmm. which allows for some fluency. And if I spoke to you like this, mm -hmm. uh, I don't think I would be comprehensible. And let me flip it just for a minute, okay? Yep. Now, I remember when my son was three and a half, and I came from a very strong whole language orientation. We were standing in his nursery school waiting for him to enter class. And there were supply boxes around the room where the school gets, you know, school supplies. And my son walked up to a box. He stood in front of it, and he said, paper. Oh, paper. Is this where the paper is, Mommy? And I really laughed to myself because he, I have never given him mm -hmm. phonological lessons, but he certainly looked at alphabet books in our house and looked at lots of stories. But he went up there, and he sounded out paper, and then he knew that that word was paper. So I can't say that, you know, I do feel that you have to know some sound letter correspondences or you, in essence, hardly, could you read anything if you had no idea yeah, what sounds? You could. Okay, how would you do that? Just if you have no idea. always recognizing that that word, uh, you know, a child by the time they're two has thousands of words in their oral vocabulary, all of which are memorized words. <coughs> if uh, after a year or two of um, reading books, I would, uh, my capsule of this mm -hmm. is you learn to read by reading. If you sat next to people as they read, if you read signs around you, you would develop a 2,000 word vocabulary. How about words you've never seen before? In other words, you know, if you're exposed, I mean, if no. you don't use any kind of letter sound correspondence. You'd get in trouble. 
and if you try to do it word by sound by sound, Not sound by you'd sound. get as, okay. you'd get into the same do amount of trouble. Okay. Sometimes it helps to know, uh, you know, when I say the word nation, and then they add an a l, mm -hmm. it changes the a sound, but I know it has something to do with nation. Right. Those are words that have so you common meaning, apparent. even though they don't have a common, they don't, uh, they don't hold on to their common root nationality. I mean, they are all, so this is, our language was designed that way. By the way, you talk, uh, can you, you imagine what Chinese children do? None of these represent sounds. The Chinese language is, and I, they learn to read in about the same amount mm -hmm. of time as we learn to read. The human mind doesn't need that connection between sound and reading. It's interesting. And now you know there are people who would not agree with I, that, obviously. Course. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask you, you have a very interesting point about um, well, what, what we call decoding and encoding. Decoding, that idea of being able to sound out the word and encoding, knowing what it means. And you have a great example. You said you can read Spanish. You can decode yeah. it, and yet you don't understand a word of it. And I can do the same. So That's partly also because Spanish is uh, phonetically, as the Latin language, there, it's a much closer phonetic connection. Unfortunately, in fact, the peculiarity of English, as I mentioned before, is the very words we most would expect young children to understand are the most likely to be language based on the language, which is not But you all. need to understand what you're yeah. sounding out, even if you're doing that. So how do we, we've been, hear, we've been hearing a lot about a vocabulary gap, that minority children are entering schools at a disadvantage in terms of vocabulary. Yeah. Do you think that's true? Well, I'm not sure it's true, okay. because the way that, I'm suspicious of the way that okay. data is collected. Uh, and nothing in my experience indicated it. I mean, I had no language problem teaching for 40 years in schools with low income, mostly black children. Uh, I, that was never a handicap. I never found a child who couldn't tell me what they needed to tell me, make up stories, and think of the, what, where did rap come from? Uh, how facile with language so where's the are. achievement gap coming from? Or do you, or is, in your mind, is there well, a, we're seeing students yeah. perform? Well, I think because we have arranged it, I don't mean okay. sat around and calculated <laughs> it. Cooked it up, right. Uh, to ensure that uh, some children are more likely to meet failure when they first are introduced. And so you so, think we uh, have an expectation for that? So we, children come into kindergarten and we expect them to speak like us. So if they speak differently than us, or in many cases don't speak at all, we think um, they're backward. But the fact of the matter is, I discovered over 40 years, the reason they don't speak is because their parents said, watch out, be wary, don't talk about your home life in school, the teacher may or may not approve of you. So, the I mean, more silent you are, the better. Now, by the time kids get in fourth and fifth grade, they forget their parents' instructions, but in, it, it takes a setting in which children assume that their language is okay. All right, so and in which they see, um, they see uh, the, the act of reading is coming to them easily. Once we're marked as a failure, as I was in reading music, it's very it's hard. hard to overcome it. Now, when we take a look at the new move to mandatory pre-K, part of that pre-K, um, the need for it has been to help children get that leg up that they may not have when they'd entered kindergarten. What do you think pre-K should be doing for children right now? It should be stimulating curiosity and the notion that, you, that your curiosity can lead you somewhere. That it's, uh, that your, uh, this kind of initiative, imagination. You know one of the unique things about human beings is we can say, what if? So uh, we can, what I call the essential habits of mind of a well-educated person. They can play with those, and play is at the heart of science, music. Every important intellectual achievement is based on a kind of playful mind, uh, and we are depriving children. So the emphasis on reading readiness, it's the whole idea of using pre-K. So they become even younger when they fail. So, All right. Um, <laughs> when should reading instruction start? Well, um, the, in Finland, which is got the highest test scores. Yeah. They don't start until children are over seven. That's approximately second or third grade. Right. Uh, the Steiner schools, I don't know if you know, Wolves, Roost, the, yeah. they don't start until the first tooth comes in or something, <laughs> around eight. <laughs> now, I, I, it, 
you can, you, if you go to either of those countries, you'll see that within a very short time they've caught up with success, children who had success at a younger age. Now, I suspect a lot of those children came in knowing how to read because it is so natural that in the normal setting, I think a great many children learn to read on naturally. They don't need someone standing in front of them talking baby talk. So parents who are watching now, maybe they have young children, are there things that we can do at home before children go to school that might, if they're not actually reading, but might make it easier for them to actually learn how you know, to read? One thing that we've lost uh, respect for that hurts me is storytelling. And I don't mean story reading. <laughs> storytelling. I mean the capacity to tell stories. Um, I'm in, I go into kindergartens and pre-kindergartens today and I never see storytelling. Teacher reads the book because rather than the pleasure of language. <laughs> so I think there could be a lot of storytelling even if parents didn't know how to read very well. And I think most parents read well enough that they could read and simple parents stories. Re you know the yes, reading to them right on their, have the child in your lap, mm -hmm. and open the book and enjoy it. Don't stop to ask them questions to see whether they, you can test them. That's how to discourage readers. I, I watch teachers under the new regimes uh, reading a lovely story to the class and stopping every page or two to ask them what to guess what comes next, next right, and, right. and you recognize, and I think, we, God, I wouldn't love stories. But we only have a minute left, if you can believe <laughs> it. I have to ask you quickly then, looking at schools today, we're hearing about balanced literacy, we're hearing about all these, a new school's chancer and new ways of reading. What do you want to see in schools in terms of teaching children how to read? Well, I, I want children to have all the advantages that the most rich, the richest families have. Which would be what then for them? Be which what? would be environments that have a lot that stimulates, that a lot of like, opportunities to put things together, to take them apart, to interact with adults and interact with older people, to keep company with an interesting world. And in terms and, of teaching reading, is there any approach you would well, want to I see schools Well, I think in such use? an environment, uh, there would be lots of books. There would be signs where it's appropriate. Um, and people would take their cue from that child. Uh, if something seems to turn that child off and makes them look frightened and suddenly get stiff, stop doing that. If a child asks you, what is that word, tell them the answer unless this child says, I don't want you to tell me. So it's, it's being a good observer of children, just uh, as we were when they were uh, littler before they went to school. That means we need smaller class sizes, we need more resources within the class, um, the kinds of things, you know. My, know rich, my friends in New York who are rich send their kids to schools with 12 and 13 children in class. Well, and it's easier for a teacher to observe. Yes, of course, and then it's right. Just very quickly, uh, in terms of um, parents worrying that their children are not learning how to read quickly enough, it, it, you said, you know, we, we start really yeah. early. Is that a genuine concern? I know schools are now <coughs> saying if your child isn't reading, it's yeah. going to be a problem. Should we lighten up on that concern? Yes. Or? <laughs> uh, you know, if we had the same tightness about when they learn to talk or walk, we would have a nation of cripples no. and a nation of stutterers, literally. I mean, uh, there's a long span and the children who talk early don't talk better when they become grown-ups and the children who walked early are not better walkers. So uh, we sh let, let us assume that the human being is an intellectually curious and that it's part of our human nature to make sense of things. So if yes. one of the things we want to make sense of is this book or those words over there, Ed Cast, uh, you can do it. You can do it. That's a very positive way of looking at how children learn, and I want to thank you so much for joining us today. Deborah Meyer, acclaimed educator, and again, thank you so much for coming to EdCast. Don't go away. We'll be back with our Ed Bites. Welcome back to this edition of Ed Bites. New research says parents would do well to ignore the pleas of kids who want to stay up late. Children who don't sleep much may be more than just sleepy in school. They may actually be learning less, too. Research shows that children getting the most quality sleep perform better in subjects such as math and language. According to lead researcher Reut Gruber, quote, short or poor sleep 
is a significant risk factor for poor academic performance that is frequently ignored. Same as we all know the person who was a great student, but not so successful later in life. According to a recent study from the National Bureau of Economic Research, that shouldn't come as a surprise. Acing exams, it seems, is not enough to guarantee success. The study found that exams measuring student achievement don't capture character traits such as motivation, which are important for success in school and the workplace. These traits should be encouraged early on, preferably in early childhood programs and elementary school. In order to qualify for some federal funds, failing schools were required to add extended learning time such as extra time to the school day or year. Did it work? Researchers say it's difficult to know. Adding that time is not easy. It's expensive and everyone does it differently. There were some improvements in test scores and graduation rates, but most of the schools used other learning strategies as well. So bottom line, extending the time may have helped a little, but there's no definitive answer. The New York City Department of Education announced that it will add dual language programs at 40 city schools, including instruction in Mandarin, French, Haitian Creole, Hebrew, Japanese, or Spanish. In these programs, lessons are taught both in English and a second language, with the goal of students becoming fluent in both. Many high-performing dual language programs enroll both native speakers of English as well as speakers of the additional language in the same class, ensuring that all students in the class are language learners. Schools Chancellor Carmen Farina observed that with a new initiative, quote, we are also recognizing that speaking multiple languages is an asset for students, families, schools, and our entire city. You know the old joke, what do you call someone who speaks many languages? Multilingual. Multilingual. What do you call someone who speaks two languages? Bilingual. What do you call someone who speaks one language? An American. American. Well, that does it for this edition of EdCast. <laughs> Until next time, class dismissed. Okay.